This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, September 2007. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 53. Madame de l'Estorade to Madame Gaston. My dear Louise, I have read and re-read your letter, and the more deeply I enter into its spirit, the clearer does it become to me that it is the letter, not of a woman, but of a child. You are the same old Louise, and you forget what I used to repeat over and over again to you, that the passion of love belongs rightly to a state of nature, and has only been purloined by civilization. So fleeting is its character, that the resources of society are powerless to modify its primitive condition, and it becomes the effort of all noble minds to make a man of the infant Cupid. But, as you yourself admit, such love ceases to be natural. Society, my dear, abhors sterility, but, substituting a lasting sentiment for the mere passing frenzy of nature, it has succeeded in creating that greatest of all human inventions, the family, which is the enduring basis of all organized society. To the accomplishment of this end, it has sacrificed the individual, man as well as woman, for we must not shut our eyes to the fact that a married man devotes his energy, his power, and all his possession to his wife. Is it not she who reaps the benefit of all his care? For whom, if not for her, are the luxury and wealth, the position and distinction, the comfort and the gaiety of the home? Oh, my sweet, once again you have taken the wrong turning in life. To be adored is a young girl's dream, which may survive a few springtimes. It cannot be that of the mature woman, the wife and mother. To a woman's vanity it is, perhaps, enough to know that she can command adoration if she likes. If you would live the life of a wife and mother, return, I beg of you, to Paris. Let me repeat my warning. It is not misfortune which you have to dread, as others do. It is happiness. Listen to me, my child. It is the simple things of life, bread, air, silence, of which we do not tire. They have no piquancy which can create distaste. It is highly flavored dishes which irritate the palate, and in the end exhaust it. Were it possible that I should to-day be loved by a man for whom I could conceive a passion, such as yours for Gaston, I would still cling to the duties and the children who are so dear to me. To a woman's heart the feelings of a mother are among the simple, natural, fruitful, and inexhaustible things of life. I can recall the day, now nearly fourteen years ago, when I embarked on a life of self-sacrifice with the despair of a shipwrecked mariner, clinging to the mast of his vessel. Now, as I invoke the memory of past years, I feel that I would make the same choice again. No other guiding principle is so safe, or leads to such rich reward. The spectacle of your life, which, for all the romance and poetry with which you invest it, still remains based on nothing but a ruthless selfishness, has helped to strengthen my convictions. This is the last time I shall speak to you in this way, but I could not refrain from once more pleading with you when I found out that your happiness had been proof against the most searching of all trials." And one more point I must urge on you, suggested by my meditations on your retirement. Life, whether of the body or the heart, consists in certain balanced movements. Any excess introduced into the working of this routine gives rise either to pain or to pleasure, both of which are a mere fever of the soul, bound to be fugitive because nature is not so framed as to support it long. But to make of life one long excess is surely to choose sickness for one's portion. You are sick, because you maintain at the temperature of passion a feeling which marriage ought to convert into a steadying, purifying influence. Yes, my sweet, I see it clearly now. The glory of a home consists in this very calm, this intimacy, this sharing alike of good and evil, which the vulgar ridicule. How noble was the reply of the Duchess de Sully, the wife of the great Sully, to some one who remarked that her husband, for all his grave exterior, did not scruple to keep a mistress. "'What of that?' she said. "'I represent the honour of the house, and should decline to play the part of a courtesan there.' "'But you, Louise, who are naturally more passionate than tender, would be at once the wife and the mistress. With the soul of a Heloise, and the passions of a St. Teresa, 
you slip the leash on all your impulses, so long as they are sanctioned by law. In a word, you degrade the marriage right. Surely the tables are turned. The reproaches you once heaped on me for immorally, as you said, seizing the means of happiness from the very outset of my wedded life, might be directed against yourself for grasping at everything which may serve your passion. What, must nature and society alike be in bondage to your caprice? You are the old Louise. You have never acquired the qualities which ought to be a woman's. Self-willed and unreasonable as a girl, you introduce withal into your love the keenest and most mercenary of calculations. Are you sure that, after all, the price you ask for your toilettes is not too high? All these precautions are to my mind very suggestive of mistrust. Oh, dear Louise, if only you knew the sweetness of a mother's efforts to discipline herself in kindness and gentleness to all about her! My proud, self-sufficing temper gradually dissolved into a soft melancholy, which in turn has been swallowed up by those delights of motherhood which have been its reward. If the early hours were toilsome, the evening will be tranquil and clear. My dread is lest the day of your life should take the opposite course. When I read your letter to a close, I prayed God to send you among us for a day, that you might see what family life really is, and learn the nature of those joys which are lasting and sweeter than tongue can tell, because they are genuine, simple, and natural. But alas, what chance have I with the best of arguments against a fallacy which makes you happy? As I write these words, my eyes fill with tears. I had felt so sure that some months of honeymoon would provide a surfeit and restore you to reason. But I see that there is no limit to your appetite, and that, having killed a man who loved you, you will not cease till you have killed love itself. Farewell, dear misguided friend. I am in despair that the letter which I hoped might reconcile you to society by its picture of my happiness should have brought forth only a paean of selfishness. Yes, your love is selfish. You love Gaston far less for himself than for what he is to you. End of letter 53